I want to welcome all of you to this year's first Speaking of Books event, which was begun by the libraries in 2005 to showcase some of the excellent writing <coughs> and research and books that are being published by our own authors here on campus. Um, and it is with great pleasure that I introduce my friend and colleague, um, anthropology professor Judith Friedenberg. Uh, her research areas include applied health research, international immigration, ethnographic methods, museum scholarship, and aging. And her work encompasses people living in the United States, Argentina, and the U.S. nationals abroad. Judith is also the director of the Anthropology of the Immigrant Life Course Research Program and director of the graduate program in museum scholarship and material culture. She has served as a board member and academic liaison to the Washington Association of Professional Anthropologists from 2000 to present and served as its president from 2004 to 2005. Judith has edited the Anthropology of Low-Income Urban Enclaves, published in 1995 by the New York Academy of Sciences, and Special Issues of Practicing Anthropology, Journal of Latino and Latin American Studies, and Journal of Latin American Anthropologies. She's published the following books. Growing Old in El Barrio, published in 2000 by New York University Press, Memorias de Villa Clara, which was published in 2005, by the Museo Histórico Regional, The Invention of the Jewish Gaucho, uh, Via Clara and the Construction of Argentine Identity, published in 2009 by Texas University Press, and then translated into Spanish in 2013 by Prometeo Editorial. And her current book, Contemporary Conversations on Immigration in the United States, the View from Prince George's County, Maryland, which was published this year by Lexington Books. Um, her, her awards include a fellowship from the National Institute of Mental, Mental Health and the Outstanding Graduate Advisor Award from the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences in 2012. Today, Dr. Friedenberg will discuss her new book, Contemporary Conversations on Immigration in the United States, The View from Prince George's County, Maryland. Um, I want to give you just a quick um, little preview of what she's going to be talking about, about her book, and this comes from David Griffith, Griffith, anthropology professor at East Carolina University. He states the following in his review of Professor Friedenberg's book, quote, emphasizing immigration as an issue rather than a problem, Friedenberg is careful to allow the immigrants of Prince George's County to speak for themselves, rather than either imposing her own interpretations on their thoughts and actions, or, pu or pushing them to the sidelines by means of a more abstract and erudite discussion of immigration, reserving her commentary to succinct summaries of the lived experiences of immigrants. The resulting merger of indigenous and intellectual knowledge is not only original, but also develops a rich, rich and at times subtle understanding of the complexities of immigrants' lives. And I'm confident everyone will leave this talk with a better understanding of the very complex and timely issue that is immigration. <coughs> After a talk, there will be time for discussion and copies of the book. There are only a few left are available at the back of the room, um, and uh, Judith will be happy to sign them for you. So at this point, I would <coughs> warmly like to invite um, Judith up to give her talk. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that nice introduction. And thanks for the invitation uh, to share here, for being part of this conversation with you all today because many of you in one way or another have contributed, in my view, to writing this book. Let me begin by sharing why I wrote this book. And I can think of at least five reasons. One is personal. I constantly reflect on what I call diversity within diversity <clears throat> as I negotiate multiple identities, 
woman, professor, mother, grandmother, wife, Latin American, Argentine, naturalized US citizen, just to name a few. Another reason is occupational. I work for the University of Maryland, and often I hear stigmatized comments about the public space close to campus, especially those spaces, spaces with large number of uh, foreign-born people. As a researcher, I was interested in contributing to the spares knowledge base on the immigrants in the county so that I could engage in conversations with people such as yourselves. As an anthropologist, I worried about the impact of silencing the immigrant voices that I heard if I did not share them with people like yourself through publications among other venues. Finally, as a human being, I wondered whether our understanding of the United States as a nation state would be incomplete if we left out some voices, including those of immigrants. So with this book, I want to convey the following message. Although we commonly assert that the US is a nation of immigrants, historically, the reception of newcomers has often been ambivalent in the US, if not distrustful. Often in the same historical period, there are two opposing ways of framing immigration. When immigration is framed as problem, we hear of a lot of solutions sought to eradicating the problem, and typically the immigrants are considered to be the problem. When immigration is framed as a social issue, the concern is about society at large. That is, the issues speak about all of us. Working on this book, I learned that the immigrant experience is crucial to the framing of immigration. And I set out to contextualize in one county, county um, to contextualize the immigrant's experience in one county by asking questions such as, where did the people of Prince George's come from? How were the immigrants talked about? What is relevant in the immigrant experience? First, the immigrant experience needs to be situated within the history of the administrative place we now call Prince George's County, which is where the immigrants I studied would settle in. Since its founding in the mid-17th century, the county has had a long and conflicted history of cultural contact between American Indians, Europeans, and Africans, all immigrants. American Indians came from Asia and were transforming into chiefdoms at the time of European contact. The first European immigrants were English landowners and traders, as well as their indentured servants from all over the United Kingdom. African slaves were brought as involuntary immigrants to expand the mono-production of tobacco, and were in the majority um, at the time of the drawing of this map in 1861. By the 20th century, there was internal migration of African Americans from Washington, D.C. to Prince George's County. Affordable housing in suburban apartments and access to desegregated education became symbols of upward social mobility. By the 21st century, the distribution of the county's population reflected the internal migration of African Americans as well as the inflow of international immigrants. And today, the county of Prince George's is 65% African American, 20% foreign born from El Salvador, Guatemala, Nigeria, Mexico, Jamaica, in this order and 15% white. 
It is important to note at this point that the ethnic and class inequality that characterize the history of the county will influence the experience of the immigrants who settled there. A second way I contextualized the immigrant experience was through two projects about how immigration is talked about. One project investigated how the major print media in the region covered immigration. The content of the Washington Post and the Baltimore Sun was perused chronologically since the beginning of their publication in the mid-1800s. And a major theme that came up early on was immigration reform. A plea published by the Baltimore Sun called for, quote, a radical revision of the laws regulating immigration, offering to the honest immigrant a friendly reception and protection, but unqualifiedly condemning the transmission to our shores of felons and paupers, end quote. Italics are mine. This plea was corroborated by the Washington Post more than three decades later, specifying that, quote, when the labor market is depressed, many of the immigrants now arriving consist of the most ignorant and depraved classes with instincts and methods of conspiracy and revenge, end quote. And again, my italics. So we can see that um, in the mid-century, 19th century, as now, immigration was a way of talking about inclusion and exclusion in the larger society. Uh, another project uh, that I worked on engaged public opinion through reactions to an exhibit on the immigrant experience in Prince George's County and the audience engaged in conversations, some of them were interviewed, and I want to point out two themes um, that um, were um, uh, interesting. One was the lack of awareness of the number of diversity of immigration in the county. Um, a 12-year-old from China said, quote, wow, I have no idea, so many foreign born, and I'm one of them. End quote. Another theme was the attempt to understand why some native-born Americans frame immigration as a structural problem, as seen in the second quote that says, native-born Americans against immigrants bring up a question of their relative scarcity or insecurity, end quote. Having set the context, I will now turn to the research conducted on the experiences of immigrants, whom I will call narrators. A crucial method to understand the immigrant experience were life histories that were conducted in 70 households in collaboration with students and colleagues. As you can see from this map, the narrators came from many countries that were chosen to approximate the current demographic distribution of immigration in the county. That is, 70% um, were from the Americas, 20% from Asia, 8% from Africa, and only 1% from Europe. To understand the experience of human mobility, I invite you to think of space, time and their interrelationships. I think of space as country of birth, the border, neighborhoods of residence, work, and play in the US. I think of time in both a historic and an autobiographical sense. And I think that it's important to um, understand and reflect and, and research their interrelationships in both cognitive and empirical ways, because um, they help understand and locate what um, are typically called transitions in the immigrant life course. In turn, the transitions help understand the political economy and the immigration policies 
in both countries of origin and settlement. And the book documents three transitions in the immigrant life course, leaving, arrival, and assessing change. Because the immigrant experience is so important in my view, I'll let them um, uh, talk uh, for you, address you directly in, in a few seconds. Um, as I chose um, three cases of the many that were interviewed to, um, to give you uh, a, a, an idea of the diversity of experiences in each of the transitions. The first transition involves leaving the country of origin. And I ask, how was the US imagined at a distance? What was the influence of the political economy in both country of origin and destination on the growing gap years? What were the triggers and the enablers that made the would, mi the would be migrant transition between making an exit decision and actually leaving? As we will hear, some leave looking for the good life, others to escape from violence, others seeking opportunity. This is the first case for the first transition. Decidí venir porque la situación económica en mi país este, no era muy buena y, y tengo familia en Argentina, en Buenos Aires, y me ofrecieron para irme, pero justo estaba el problema del el famoso corralito en el año 2001, fue eso. Y bueno, y, y la cosa no estaba muy buena tampoco en Argentina. Este, y en Brasil tampoco era tan buena y los amigos en España me decían que tampoco era tan buena entonces los únicos que me decían que la cosa más o menos estaba bien aquí y bueno, y aquí estoy these people, you don't belong to them, but they give you all this opportunity to be somebody. So peaceful, people can live the way they want to, freedom. This is where I want to come. And the third. I worked as a domestic servant for about 10 years in my country before I got an opportunity to come to the United States. Um, I've always heard of the United States, I saw different shows on television about the United States and I had this dream that I would like to go to America, is how we refer to it. And I wanted to be a secretary, <laughs> I wanted to be a secretary. So I came to the United States in 1980, that was the highlight of my life that opportunity to come to the United States to start a new life. I came with lots of dreams and goals and ambitions. No money, of course, <laughs> but lots of ambition. The, next the second transition in the immigrant life course is arrival to the United States. And I ask, did the imagined US conform to what they encountered upon arrival? How do they make sense of the new while preserving the old? How do they learn the new culture and cope when lost in translation? Again, the narrators. Y a lo primero, este, tuvo difícil el trabajo hasta que, como no, no, no encontraba trabajo en lo que yo, mi oficio, que es electricidad, este, tuve que empezar a trabajar en drywall este, y no sabía nada, nunca en mi vida había visto drywall entonces este, tuve que aprender todo nuevo de cero, todo nuevo tuve que aprender el oficio y estuve aproximadamente unos ocho meses aprendiendo con un señor y luego 
Bueno, después ya no tuve problema porque ya aprendí bien el oficio y desde ese momento hasta el día de hoy, a veces regular y a veces mejor, está bien el trabajo. Este, yo creo que todos los hispanos estamos bien en Estados Unidos. El problema es que no tenemos la familia. Si pudiéramos tener toda la familia aquí, este, viviríamos todos aquí, <ríe> mucho mejor. Eh, pero no está la familia, entonces eso complica todo. Familia, amigos. Este. Let's see what the second one, second case says. I work different kind of job. Uh, I work in a big shop where people were throwing flowers at my face and say, your people are starving, what are you doing here, you scum? Uh, I, have, I have people calling me all kinds of names, but all this time I was looking at the light at the end of the time. I finished my school, I graduated with Kimi Pelada. I went to a fourth year uh, college, I continued my nursing, I got my bachelor's. Dina and I were staying in my sister's house and it was not... Um, It was not a good picture. I have, I have, I have, uh, Dina and I have seen so much in that house. And uh, I walked to work with a sneaker in the snow uh, from my sister's house to work, my feet frozen. And one day I said to her, Can your husband give us a ride, uh, give me a ride to work? She said, My husband is not your driver. And this is my younger sister. Entonces, When they come in the evening, feed them, put the children in bed. I did it all. But what hurts me through all this was my child. I, I, I don't want to cry, oh God. Whenever I think about this, it just makes me. I didn't have time for my child, which I'll never forget either. When she came from school, she was walking in the woods by herself. I don't know when I'm going to give up. It always hurts me when I think I'm sorry. It's okay. I was attending for the children because I want to have income and I want to start my life, but my child, zero, she didn't have anybody. She was walking in the woods coming from school. She could be scared in the woods because she has never seen this kind of life. But like I said before, you know what? All will, all this will pass. I am building something for my children where women can be what they want to be, and these are women. And the third case, uh, and I'm right on. That was my life's dream, <laughs> to be a secretary. I got my certificate. Um, from Washington School for Secretary. After I accomplished that goal, it's like I wanted more. So I enrolled in community college. This is Eric. He attended Fork Union Military Academy for his high school, high school year. And this is my pride and joy right here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I um, I did not send him to Fork Union because, well, he was a bad, but to keep him in a safe environment because my because of my thanks, because of my work schedule, I think it was important that he was in a constructive, secure environment. So he attended Fork Union for three years in the Caribbean, a village raised a child. Here in this country, a the parent is responsible for raising that child. Because most of, I live in an apartment before I live here. I didn't know my neighbors. 
Everyone went about the way, came back, went in, closed the door. They didn't know your neighbors. Home, ye everyone knew you. So you knew to behave yourself when you were on the street or they will find your parent. <laughs> you will be punished. I remember tears in my eyes one morning when I went down. I was working as a, a contractor, a secretary for a company for the Department of Agriculture. And I walk in the halls, get to my office, and I said good morning to one, two, three people, and no one answered. Tears in my eyes, because I didn't know anything about that. I wasn't used to that. And I felt hurt. It's not the government's responsibility. The government is not responsible for us. Look at all the opportunities. I had no opportunity. But here I came to this country, there were student loans. You can apply to the government and borrow and pay a small amount. People just don't take advantage of the opportunities that are here. And then I've gotten this resentment, you foreigners, you know, come and take a opportunity. No! It's so much here for everyone. That is why too, I say America is a blessed country. This country is blessed. Look how many millions of us came from other country to add to the millions that are already in this country. And everyone can get a piece of the pie. Why not? The third transition in the Immigrant Life Course is assessing what changed between making an exit decision and the time of interview. And I ask, how do the narrators see themselves and others in the U.S.? What changed? What did not change? Where did it change? Again, the three narrators. Yo trabajo en la construcción. Este, vemos que construimos todo. O sea, el 90% de las casas en todo el 90% de las casas se construyen y se mantienen gracias a la inmigración hispana que continuamente uno se pone viejo y enseguida viene otro más joven y va renovando, aprende y, este, y bueno, en el campo, en todos los renglones yo creo que este, los hispanos somos una fuente, una fuente fuerte de laboral en, un brazo fuerte de trabajo en, en, en Estados Unidos. The second case. There was no job I applied and have been declined. For some reason, people like me, and I think nursing is my call. It's not a job, it's my call, it's my duty. I love caring for people. Uh, there is no difference between me and that patient. That patient is my mother, my sister, my family. Uh, I would not even give 99%. I give 100% when I care for people. And I wish everybody is like that. And when I decide to leave uh, uh, the hospital nursing, one of the reasons that made me decide other than my physical limitation is the nurses who are on the floor, the way they treat the patients. I have so many young nurses, I pulled on the side and said, would you do that to your mom? Why are you doing that? The third and final case. I consider America truly the land of opportunity. If you cannot make it here, you cannot make it anywhere in the world because it's up to you. The opportunities are there. It's up to you, the individual, to go. It's not gonna come to you. You have to go get it. And um, today I'm an American citizen. <laughs> Even though I have this Caribbean accent, I'm proud to be a Caribbean American because I, I am privileged to have both worlds. In the smallest way, you can reach out to someone, reach out. 
because just someone's life history can make a difference in someone else's life. That my God, that person made it. That gave me hope. So what do the narrated experiences help us learn about immigration? One finding is that the age of the narrator at arrival and the prevalent immigration policy are important factors in acculturation. On the one hand, the earlier in the life course a person arrives, the longer the time spent in the United States. On the other, the prevalent policy at time of arrival informs the political and the public discourse that in turn will influence not only the legal status of the immigrant, but also her sense of belonging and her well-being. So I analyze the immigrant experience by age and policy periods. The age cohorts were based uh, on the demographic distribution of the narrator sample. The policy periods chosen were based on major policy changes that impacted them. 1965, when the Immigration and Nationality Act opened, opened the US doors to all countries to reunite families and to attract skilled labor. 1986, when the Immigration Reform and Control Act changed the legal status for millions of foreign born. 2001, when after 9-11, uh, the Immigration Naturalization Service became part of the new Department of Homeland Security. And forever or since then, immigration became a part of border governance. 2006, the Secure Fence Act authorized the building of a fence in the U.S.-Mexican border. And in 2012, the DREAM Act passed in Maryland. The second finding based on the immigrant experience is that even before departure, immigrants install what I called a cognitive translation machine, end quote, that forever compares and contrasts where life is better. This narrator-generated model disputes the conversion narrative of traditional assimilation models, which expect, expect an immigrant to quote unquote, become American. Rather, I found that the narrators are very resilient and reinvent themselves as hybrids who in, inhabit a, this cognitive place called, that I call immigrant space that could blend multiple identities in many spaces, including many countries. The third ma major finding based on the analysis of the immigrant experience relates to <coughs> social mobility, which is often taken as an indicator of assimilation. I found that most narrators, particularly those in the working class, did not experience a major change in their social standing. And yet, it's interesting to note that I found that most of those perceived having done better. The reason, I argue, is that they assess changes in immigrant space, not in a particular place or country. So what has learning about the immigrant experience in Prince George's County taught us about the U.S. as a nation state. Overall, we've seen similarities and differences in the three immigrant life course transitions in all three cases. There was extreme complexity and variability in the first transition, leaving, um, and we saw how the exit decision reflected the political economy and policies at both countries of origin and destination. We have seen that immigrants, uh, how immigrants cope with cultural contact during the transition of arrival, how they experience the framing of immigration as problem, and their 
human capacity for resilience to cope. We have seen how immigrants reinvent themselves through a hybrid identity in immigrant space. We learned that immigration is not solely about individuals, but about families and households. That people move mostly to make better, although the policies at the time of arrival will uh, predict the flow. That immigrants connect nation states through the exchanges of material goods, services, and ideas among social networks in various countries. That most immigrants make temporary plans for stay regardless of how long they stay in the country, in the US. So, instead of using or focusing on country of origin and other of the traditional variables we talk about when we think about immigrants. Particularly, we could, perhaps we could um, um, think that um, assimilation and acculturation is, are predicted by two major factors. One is the context of reception. And I, by that I mean policies, the political discourse, public attitudes regarding the foreign born, and two, the available structure of opportunity in um, sectors such as employment, housing, education, health. To conclude, I want to leave you with two thoughts and one question. The first thought is that paying attention to the immigrant experience helps understand the complexity of the human condition, which is grounded in personal, cultural, social, economic, political spheres of influence, much like, like native-born people um, experience. The second thought is that the way we frame immigration affects the very meaning we convey to the US as a nation state. So perhaps rather than thinking of immigrant acculturation to the nation, we can think of cultural contact between native and foreign born populations. And here's the question. What accounts for translating difference into either inequality or diversity? Let's move on to conversations and thanks for listening. Did you take into account the ability of the immigrants to speak English well? One of the people, of course, whom you interviewed, her, spoke with you in Spanish, yes, rather than in English. And what about the other people with whom you spoke? The majority were um, bilingual, and we gave them the choice when we conducted the interviews of speaking in languages that we, the interviewers, could speak. Um, um, they're in their native language, uh, if the interviewers could speak that language, um, or in English. And uh, it was uh, rare that we had people um, speaking only in their uh, native language. It just happened that um, because I am originally from Argentina and can speak Spanish, um, you know, he knew that and he chose to speak in Spanish most of the time, but he did have a lot of difficulty speaking English, and, um, and that's why we did the translation. Thanks for your presentation. Um, okay. I know one of the people um, that you interviewed, and she's a lovely, lovely person, Megdis. She goes to my church. But uh, I came here to try to understand uh, the Latin American immigration pattern in Prince George's County. Mm -hmm. And that last question, in my mind, there, the difference is, is, is both economic and racial. And um, unfortunate, um, but I think that is the case. Um, 
and I think within the last four to five years, that is, has even heightened. I would say five years ago, I don't think I felt the same way. Um, but I feel the current political climate has really kind of elevated and exposed that le the level of racial and economic discrimination. Particularly of Latinos, you're saying? Particularly about. of Latinos and immigrants in general. Mm -hmm. You know, that uh, even the, the term, the browning of America, to me, is a racist comment. It's not a positive, you know, description of what is going on. We don't celebrate the multicultural perspectives that bring uh, that exchange that bring all kinds of you know wonderful exchanges around you know cultures and and food and communication. We don't celebrate that. We celebrate that at a very superficial level, having these restaurants and whatever. But people do not come together. Uh, I will never forget, after 9-11, a restaurant right around the corner here, Food Factory, mm -hmm. always busy, always busy. My son and I used to eat there every Wednesday with a group of his friends from Friends Community School. For that first week, not a soul seemed to be coming into that restaurant because there was already that, you know, people were implying that the, you know, 9-11 was the, you know, the result of, it's an Afghani restaurant, Pakistani restaurant. Um, so, I, and I thought it was interesting that your Trinidadian woman <laughs> never raised, I mean, she spoke like a Republican, <laughs> and um, never encountered any kind of racial kind of discrimination in her desires to, you know, build herself up from becoming a secretary to whatever else she was going to do. And I'm glad you bring that up because um, something that I uh, pay attention in the book analyzing is um, social class um, mobility and with, you know, across the life course. And um, some people um, um, like um, her came from, um, well, I'm talking about the, um, did you mention the Ethiopian yes. lady? Yes, she came from uh, a position of wealth, um, uh, middle or upper middle class uh, in her country of origin, suffered downward social mobility upon arrival and was forced to work as a live-in domestic, then raised herself up, um, was able to, um, I guess, um, um, use her education capital that she brought with her and pursue education, became a professional. And then um, she was able to, to become a nurse and, um, and raise her two children. But, um, in, um, you know, that's something else that I think that we don't pay attention to enough uh, social class differences. And I think that those are um, very vivid in, um, in the landscape of Prince George's today. You can be of one race and you can have um, different social classes concentrated in different neighborhoods. So I'm a little bit curious about how your own personal experience factored in to all of this. Mm -hmm. I, I'm really excited to hear about that, if you yeah. could be willing to share something sure. about that. Sure, sure. Um, and I um, write about that in the prologue of uh, the book, which I can read or you can read. Um, but basically, I came uh, to the United States um, in 1970, um, having made temporary plans for stay. Uh, I and my husband were coming for three years to study and go back. And uh, that uh, goal was never realized because we were caught up um, 
in um, um, state terrorism, a terrible civil war in Argentina that lasted 10 years. And that happened at the same time that we were having our children. So it was a very difficult um, uh, time to come back. People were trying to leave Argentina, not to come back to Argentina. So um, that's how I chose to uh, become a US citizen. I'm just wondering though how your, how your experience factored into your research. Well, that is my experience. And you know, I think that I went through you know, trying to redefine my identity or my multiple identities in different places where I lived. Um, you know, um, we think of U.S. culture, mainstream culture, but it's very different to live in New York City, where I lived before, and to work and, and raise a family there, and it's very different to, um, to having raised children and live in this area of, uh, of uh, the country. So, um, so it, I think more and more of uh, less differences across uh, geopolitical boundaries and more, you know, regional um, similarities. I'll just say that. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, you use the phrase context of reception and available structure of opportunity. And kind of building on the prior question about language, did any of the interviewees discuss the availability or lack thereof of social resources in their native language? Because even for uh, bilingual uh, people, having something available in a native tongue can be such a big help. And I speak um, knowing the context of Washington, D.C., where all social documents have to be available in six different languages based on mm -hmm. predominant languages. And I don't know what it is in uh, Prince George's County. So it, 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 that came up. Yeah, it did come up and people <laughs> not only look uh, for available services in their own native language, but it's so important uh, to go through the support system of people who have tried to do something, get a job, um, find where to uh, uh, deliver a child and so on. There is a lot of informal communication, word of mouth, church, is another site where you gather information of how to go about it. And uh, even to get a job, like uh, the Uruguayan man um, couldn't be an electrician here. He didn't, um, you know, there were several different reasons why he couldn't. Um, but, um, but he turned around and somebody else told him that what was uh, in demand was uh, uh, doing drywall, and that's what he learned. I was wondering if you could um, share. Uh, sure. Okay. I was wondering if you could just share a little bit about um, the immigration status of some of your participants, um, and how their immigration status might have changed from arrival to mm -hmm. um, today, present day. Um, and also just interested to learn how the Central American immigrant experience um, might be similar or different from the case studies that you highlighted today. Well, actually, uh, within the 70% uh, from the Americans, the majority are from El Salvador. So El Salvador and Guatemala were the migrations that came during the Civil War. and. Um, Actually, there's always a drift, uh, a rift between Salvadorians and Guatemalans because Salvadorians uh, got asylum much more easily than Guatemalans. But um, actually, at arrival, they came, uh, the sample of 70 came uh, in different legal status. Uh, some of them uh, crossed the border with the help of coyotes or smugglers. And um, some of them uh, came in as refugees, um, for example, a Vietnamese uh, who was part of the boat people, lived several years in Thailand in a refugee camp, and then was lucky enough to have an, un an uncle in, uh, in Massachusetts, and he was able to 
come to the United States. Um, some of them came um, without legal papers because they came with um, um, diplomats and they, they diplomats are um, allowed to bring um, people who work for them, maids or nannies. Um, some of them, um, um, some of those uh, domestics, for example, um, left, escaped um, uh, um, the, the house of the diplomats because they claimed they were um, um, being, um, um, the, the being exploited. And so they became documented. They entered uh, with a legal status and then they became documented until they could uh, forge um, another, another um, uh, stage in their lives. At the time of interview, there was only one person uh, out of the 70 who remained undocumented. And um, um, in the book, I also explain uh, that the reason this was so is because I wanted to interview a wide array of people um, across social classes, and I didn't just want to focus on working class immigrants um, that I think we've, uh, we know more about than the whole diversity of experience. of immigrants in Prince George's County, and whether you did, and if you did, why um, chose to omit, I suppose, uh, more recent immigrants. I know you had like steps to the interview, so there is an assumption that they have been here for some time, but about how much time do you think it takes before they start to have either realizations of you know, young nurses not being respectful to patients or continuing to believe that America provides the good life. Thank you. Um, the people were selected um, to represent the current proportion, as I showed in the map, of uh, the immigrant, the, the immigrant population that we know of. There must be a lot of undocumented, there is a lot of undocumented people in Prince George's County that I, I nor, nor even the census can actually account for. But of the people that we, um, do, we are able to document, uh, the sample um, tried to be as representative as possible. That's why even within the Latin Americans, the majority of people interviewed were from El Salvador. And um, the, the, it was a very difficult process of selection because, um, you know, um, typically if you're going to do an interview that takes two or three sittings where you have to get uh, enough trust from the person to enter their homes, uh, videotape um, some of their surroundings and so on, uh, it takes a while. I had a wonderful cadre of students and colleagues, and it took a long time to recruit the actual people. Uh, but fortunately, nobody that we approached said no. Um, another part of, um, of your question that I think I should speak to is that because there is so much variability in the sample of the 70, uh, for um, analyzing the narrator experiences uh, for the book, I um, chose a s smaller sample of 24 that I call the narrator sample. Uh, that is representative in turn of the larger sample. And the reason I didn't uh, look for very recent entrants is because I wanted to see, um, understand the transitions in the life course. And, um, and uh, so I wanted everybody to have a certain number of years. It wasn't 
define as a specific number of years, but a few years where, where the person could make sense of, uh, of uh, assess changes and reflect on, on what happened in her life course. Thank you so much for a splendid talk, Judith. Thank I wondered you. about um, the children of immigrants. I take it this sort of issue is outside of the scope of your study, but if you have thoughts on that, um, or if you thought about that as a follow-up study, I'm, I, I know you said that the immigrants compose about 20% of, of PG County's population, so I assume if we included the children, which are still, you know, really part of the immigrant world in many ways, it would be an even larger proportion. So I'm curious about your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you very much. I didn't go into the children, uh, except if the children were in the household, um, and there were um, a few that were babies or very young children who were in the household. Um, um, and, um, in, in, um, in, in the case of um, some other of the children, for example, the photograph uh, of the Ethiopian child, um, the children were born in Ethiopia and were brought, brought over as children. So it is uh, not uncommon in every household of immigrants to find a combination of children who were born in the country of birth of the parents as well as born here. Um, as a matter of fact, um, my colleague, Dr. Gedrich, just uh, left, but um, that's um, something that she is uh, studying, and perhaps Ume can speak to that. Um, a lot, I wouldn't say most, but many um, immigrant households in Prince George's County are mixed households. They contain uh, a diversity of people born in the country of origin, people born here, people with residency, people with citizen status. You know, they're very, very diverse. You know that. Thank you very much for your talk, and I'm excited to, to read the book. Uh, I think my question follows up on the question Julie just asked, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how the schools, and in particular PG County public schools, empower or disempower uh, uh, the people that you interview, if not from the kids' point of view, since you weren't focused on, on them as much, but from the parents' point of view. You had that one person talking about sending her son to a military school, but how do schools come up or not come up? That's very interesting because I find that in Prince George's County, well, it's not what I find. I mean, there's uh, serious um, studies about um, uh, extreme seg neighborhood segregation in Prince George's County, and that is not necessarily only due to ethnicity or race, uh, but also um, to class and um, the, you know, the, uh, unfortunately, because of neighborhood segregation, um, what you have is that if you're a Latin American family and you have to send your child to school and the school is in your neighborhood, chances are that 95% of your child's peers will be also Latin American. Um, so despite the great gains of um, uh, racial desegregation in schools in, in, in the country, which in Prince George's County was quite late in time, was um, 70, 72, uh, to really be implemented. I personally think that we are replicating an unwanted condition. Maybe somebody else knows more about that. Um, and that applies across classes because there is um, segregation of um, African American um, middle class neighborhoods where the children either go to a good school, public school in the neighborhood, or they go to private school. 
Um, so um, I ask, you know, how can, you know, really um, acculturate or help acculturate the immigrants that census figures say that this is going to be the majority of the labor force in 2050. What are we doing to acculturate or to, you know, those to, to um, promote integration if we segregate people by neighborhoods? Um, so I want to ask you, in one of the interviews, the interview mentioned that America is a land of opportunity and you can get, everyone can get a piece of pie. And I know you mentioned there is a bit of variability. Did you find that a lot of your, um, a lot of the participants felt that way or felt the same way as her? Or did you find variability in that sense about this country being able to provide resources and the policies? Were they friendly towards immigrants in general? Could you speak a little bit more about that experience, please? Well, there was extreme variability, but um, everybody um, who makes a decision to come to the United States definitely hears about the American dream. And we continue to talk about the American dream. As a matter of fact, I read in the paper, I think, this morning um, that there are new studies from the Brookings Institution um, about poverty and reassessing the American dream. So a lot about the American dream is um, an economic assessment that anybody who works hard can get a piece of the pie, as uh, the uh, narrator said. Um, but uh, the question is, can you? Because, um, you know, if, if uh, in the book I also compare the um, the possibilities for um, socioeconomic mobility for the immigrants with the um, um, the United States population uh, in general, and there is good data to demonstrate uh, to show that um, there is a flattening of opportunity in the United States, and there are not that many opportunities for advancement. That sometimes you compare incomes from one generation to the next and there hasn't been all that much change. So that doesn't have to do with immigration. That has to do with all of us, with the nation. And, and that's why I argue um, for the further possibilities for analysis of advocating for um, um, uh, immigration, framing immigration as a social issue. Because those issues affect all of us. Um, well, as an immigrant, I am an immigrant, I'm the daughter of Haitian parents. Um, you have to work that much harder <laughs> in this country to arrive at a, a level of, of uh, you know, sufficiency. I mean, it, uh, because they don't only see, you know, hear your accent, and they've heard my my father's accent. There's no question. You know, my dad had a very thick accent, um, and he was a physician, trained here in the United States. You know, came here without learning, not knowing English, but still, you know, got his medical degree, residency, and everything in in, uh, in the United States. But that accent never left, and he was black. <laughs> okay, he's a black man, and so it was clear that he wasn't from this country, and he had to work. He couldn't just, you know, we lived in a, what I would call an exclusive neighborhood in New York, Scarsdale, is where I grew up, okay? But we moved there because he had three children and he didn't want to live in Queens and put three kids in private school because the schools in the city were not as good. And so he sacrificed and drove an hour and a half every day to Queens because he could only serve, not only, but he served black children because it's only other black and Caribbean people who would go to a Haitian doctor. Nobody in Scarsdale was coming to a pediatrician with a thick accent like his. And so you make a lot of sacrifices in terms of commuting time, time away from the family. Touch my heart what Magda said in terms of she felt bad not being able to 
you know, walk with her child and be part of her child's, you know, growing up because she was working all the time. And that's a dynamic that a lot of immigrant families are in all the time because they are trying to provide the American dream for their children, but at a big, big cost. Recording. That's why. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, back to the children uh, that you were speaking of. Karen and I are both ESOL teachers in Prince George's County, and we're at a um, a part of the county that is probably has the largest immigrant population of students in the entire Prince George's County. That would be the the um, Adelphi Elementary, mm -hmm. Langley Park. Yeah. Mother Jones, Cool Spring, where I'm at, she's next door at Adelphi. And we see a lot of things that you're talking about here. But um, Maryland University is one of our partners. Mm -hmm. We have partners in print. We offer a lot of programs. But oftentimes we find that a lot of the parents in this particular area you're wondering how they all know to come to Meserat Road and Riggs Road because that is where the comfort zone is. And I think that they all find each other and there's this pipeline mm -hmm. that they, they know to come to Riggs Road, University, Ridgecrest. There's a boundary that you can actually kind of tell of the migration pattern. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you want to do any studies with children, you just come to Cool Spring, Great. <laughs> and we just got 10 newcomers. Oh, wow. They, they come as a revolving door. Seven in two weeks. They come with no English. Uh, we have next door to our school, we have the, um, the Judy Hoyer Center. It's a clearinghouse. It's go the International Student Guidance Office. Um, they have, we have free daycare there. They can drop kids off, go upstairs, computer classes, language classes, but many of the parents, for whatever reason, it's only a very small portion that will actually avail themselves of the English classes, the computer classes. We have, tomorrow night I'll be there for Partners in Print. Mm -hmm. we, where the Maryland students come and offer, you know, uh, how to help your child with homework. So we do have resources and programs, mm -hmm. but you're right in that. If they don't, if, our, if this population does not break away, it, you can see it getting bigger and bigger, mm -hmm. and they're just like boxing, getting boxed in. Mm -hmm. and, and so I don't know what we can do to, you know, as ESOL teachers to help, you know, we do what we can, but it's almost overwhelming to the, you know, to the school system um, in a yeah. large part. But Julie, we have uh, a new study that we can collaborate on. Yeah, I would love to. <laughs> I, I think that's very, very important. And, and be, you know, these people are pretty invisible, um, you know, to the larger population as well as many other immigrants that are pretty invisible like, um, I don't know the percentage, but I know there are as many um, foreign-born professors at the University of Maryland, such as myself, uh, foreign-born staff persons um, that, um, that work for the University of Maryland. We have many children who are here with other relatives, but with not without parents. Right. So that's another. That's another. <laughs> time for two more questions. So I think you two, if that's okay, you first. 
Hi. Um, I just want to first thank you for inviting all of us. Thank um, you. This is a discussion that we should have in many different areas. I work for Casa de Maryland, um, one of the biggest immigrant organization around PG County. And then one And now, one. yeah, thank you. And um, now in Virginia, Baltimore, Pennsylvania, and adding and adding and adding. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do is add um, to what she was mentioning. Um, what we encounter the most is that if the parents don't have the adequate um, education, the children want to want continue education and father themselves. Um, we have um, Spanish literacy classes, and the Spanish literacy classes have made us realize that we could have all the resources for them to take computer classes. We could have all, and not just in Spanish literacy classes, it could be Ethiopian classes, literacy classes, or African American um, literacy classes. But if they don't have the basic language, it will be harder for them to read a flyer saying we have computer classes or English classes. We discover, um, I work in Silver Springs, so we have a huge um, community from Guatemala, and uh, they don't even speak Spanish. They have different dialects. So in these 22 different dialects, to be precise, if I'm, I make a mistake, maybe more. Um, and they cannot even communicate among each other. So I'm sure that that doesn't just happen in Spanish cultures. That happens in different other um, cultures where they have different dialects. So I think that's one of the hardest part of us, the ones that find the resources for them, because they don't even have their own basic uh, language completed, you know? And so it will be harder for them. It's like learning three different ones, because they have to learn the Spanish one, because people already assume that they speak Spanish. But it's a mistake that we all do. And we send a flyer. Teachers, I'm sure that they make that mistake, because we have an after-school program where um, she was a uh, part of it, and um, we send flyers, and we ask them automatically, oh, she, she understands, we already sent the Spanish flyer, but they don't speak Spanish, okay. so that's one of the biggest issues that maybe we can add um, into whatever resources are accessible for them. Thank you, Judith. Uh, my question is, how do you get this uh, information, your conclusions, and the voices of your narrators beyond this academic and very interested audience? So I'm thinking uh, policymakers and, and yeah. so on. Thank you. Uh, um, well, I, I'm trying to disseminate as, uh, as wide um, as I, as I um, possibly can. Um, I on Friday. Um, I've been Parks and Rec. Uh, Parks and Rec. Oh my goodness! You know everything that I do. <laughs> um, that's that's not open to the public. I understand, but it's part of a training for um, staff. For staff, staff. Um, you know, opportunity in celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month, a way of educating our staff about the local community. Uh, we understand that there's 20, 25 percent um, Latinos in the community. They're using our parks. They're, you know, part of our system, and so it's an opportunity for them to learn more. Right. Um, I also um, um, I'm uh, part of the American Anthropological Association People on the Move Public Initiative, and I will be giving a talk at Bus Boys and Poets in Hyattsville next Tuesday at seven. Um, I've uh, been asked um, to, um, to speak about the book in Spanish. I have to send a video um, to Argentina that I hope to send to other Latin America, to other Spanish-speaking countries. But, um, but the, what I really think that engage, engages people in, in conversations is what I've been doing with the exhibit that I curated before I did the book. Um, it is um, a portable exhibit called the um, 
the uh, immigrant experience in Prince George's County that has panels uh, with information, demographic and historic information about the county. And then it has um, videos and quotes from the informants and we typically um, I say we because I've had uh, wonderful um, colleagues and students coming with me. We accept invitations to go to um, any agency. We've been invited at Casa de Maryland. We set up the exhibit, show the video, and discussion ensues. And I think that what we need is to talk more about the issues. Um, because obviously um, we are living, um, you know, there is polarized opinions uh, about the issues, and I think that the issues are not necessarily about the immigrants, it, they're about where the immigrants live in the United States of America. Um, and uh, to end up uh, that, I, um, I put um, all the videos, including the video where um, the, these clips are extracted from in YouTube, so anybody can use the videos in, uh, and I, you know, if you later on give me your email, I can send them directly to you if you don't find them. Um, so that anybody can use the videos and, you know, again, show the videos and then start a conversation in different settings and with different audiences. Okay, I think uh, this has really been about the best question and answer period we've ever had in <laughs> these talks. I could probably go on for another two hours, but I think we need to give Professor Friedenberg a break here. Thank you. Thank you.